Well, good morning. Uh, I apologize uh, for not sending out the sermon blurbs. I won't make a habit of that. My schedule is quite different this week. But the lesson title this morning, as we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, is Jesus, Our Highway Builder. Jesus, Our Highway Builder. You know, living in Orlando, it has become patently obvious that human beings are not very efficient at building highways. <laughs> I-4, you know, does have some impressive things about it, but it just seems like it's always under construction and it is never finished. And even with the latest additions and the new lanes that we have, it just seems like there's still the same amount of traffic jams that there have always been. God is a much more efficient highway builder. You know, I originally designed this lesson uh, for Jack Thomas's funeral because I believe that Jack had a highway to heaven in his heart. But I thought before the Lord's Supper, I'd take us deeper into that subject, deeper into the subject of Jesus, our highway builder. And we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11. If you recall from years back on our class in Isaiah, the main message of Isaiah is, I save. Because... Um, God simply, <laughs> God's people rather, simply did not appreciate that salvation comes from God and God alone. They thought that salvation came through their political alliances with other nations, through their own military strength, and through their worship to false gods. And so God repeatedly urges them to stop trusting in all of those empty things that cannot save you. But of course, they ignored God's instruction. And they continued to trust in those things until eventually the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed and scattered and taken captive by the Assyrians. And then the southern kingdom of Judah was destroyed and scattered and taken captive by the Babylonians. And yet listen to God's promise to the faithful in the future. In Isaiah 11, verse 11 and 12, Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. He promises to bring all of the faithful back to him one day. And for for all those people who had been dispersed and really estranged from God and from God's presence at the temple, he says that I will lift up a standard, uh, which is a flag or a banner that armies would often lift up high on a pole to serve as a rally point for the troops. And he says, you'll have a rally point and you will rally back to me one day. And now I want you to listen to the way he describes this promise further in verse 16. He says in verse 16, there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left, just as there was for Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. So God describes the path back home to him as a highway. And if you were one of those Israelites or the people of Judah who had been scattered, you would think that this situation is hopeless. How could God accomplish such an impossible task as to form a highway for us to come back to him when we're just so, so scattered? We're basically like slaves now to these foreign nations. Well, God says, you remember that feeling your ancestors had of hopelessness when they were slaves in Egypt? <laughs> And how I cleared a highway for them right through the middle of the sea and brought them out to me. God is saying, I promise you one day I'll make a highway home for you too. Let's look in Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. Here he describes the glorious future for God's faithful remnant who returned to him. And you'll see the word, your translations may have it a little bit different in verse 1. You'll see the word crocus. That is the ugliest word for a flower. And a crocus is not an ugly flower at all. It's gorgeous. It's just this deep, rich purple. And the Arabah is a desert. And so he talks about a crocus 
blooming out of the desert. It's just an amazing picture of life and rejuvenation. And so in Isaiah 35, listen to verses 1 through 4. The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabo will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and a shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, and the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. It's a time of rejoicing because God is coming and everybody is seeing his glory and he brings recompense or judgment on the wicked, but he says he's going to save you. And so you can take heart if you are feeling like you have no strength and you are hopeless and the situation is never going to get better. God says it absolutely will. And now notice how else he describes this same time period. Just a few verses later, start with me in verse eight down through 10. A highway will be there a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander upon it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. God says he's going to make good on his promise to build a highway home for his people. And it won't just be any old highway. It'll be like a secret, hidden highway that those who are unclean could never find and can never walk upon. Those who are foolish and wander in the paths of fools, they'll never just accidentally stumble upon this highway somewhere in their journeys. No, it is only for the ransomed, and it will be called a highway of holiness, a highway of peace and and protection and, and safety from danger. And when God's people decide to walk that highway home, they will be filled with everlasting joy. Let me show you one more description of this highway in Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62, after Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, it seems like God's people have been completely forsaken. But God promises it won't seem that way forever. And so he says in verse 1, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. Drop down to verse 4. It will no longer be said to you, forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be said desolate. But you will be called, my delight is in her, in your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. Drop down to verse 10. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up a standard over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, lo, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him, and they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called sought out a city not forsaken. Such powerful language. He he says he's going to pursue his people and seek them out like a young man seeking out a, a woman as the love of his life. And when he does, he'll save his people and remove all the obstacles out of the way for their path home. He'll remove all the stones and the debris so he can build his highway for his people to return to him. And of course, the million dollar question is, how in the world is he going to do this? How is he going to accomplish such a feat? Well, we get a hint back in Isaiah 40. Look in Isaiah 40 with me. In ancient times, uh, when kings would travel, they would send demolition crews ahead of them 
to cut down trees and fill in holes and level the hills, basically to smooth out a highway or a path so that the king could travel more easily down that path. And Isaiah is going to use that imagery here in Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5. He says, A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there's a voice crying out for a demolition crew to come and level out the path for the king's arrival with his people so that they can finally see his glory. And it will be a glorious, joyful day. In verse 9, he says, Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. What Isaiah is telling them is that before the faithful remnant can walk the highway home to God, God has to first walk that highway down to them. In other words, we won't be able to come to God until He first comes to us. He must come to save us and to show us the highway home. And hopefully you all recognize that quote from Isaiah 40 about a voice crying in the wilderness because we learn in the New Testament that John the baptizer was that voice and he cried out to the people to clear the highway for the Lord's arrival. And what's amazing is, you know, Isaiah is talking about Yahweh here. He's talking about, you know, God. And when John comes to say, clear the highway for the Lord, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about God taking that highway down to us in the flesh so that we could see the glory of God that Isaiah kept talking about us needing to see. And the way John told people to prepare and to clear that highway for the Lord's arrival was to repent of their sins and recognize the need for God to come save them. Because see, if, if they did not have the humility to first admit, I need God to come save me, you know, I save, right, from Isaiah, I need God to be my Savior. If they didn't have that humility, then God coming to them in the flesh would do them no good. And that's how John prepared their hearts to be able and willing to walk that highway back home to God. And before that could happen, they had to see God's glory revealed to them. And the Gospel of John tells us how God's glory was ultimately revealed in Jesus. It was revealed in several different ways. It was revealed through Jesus' sinless life. It was revealed through His perfect teachings. It was revealed through His amazing miracles. Those were all ways that God's glory was put on display for the world to see. But ultimately... God's glory was fully revealed in Jesus' love, specifically in the greatest act of love ever known, in his death on the cross. So I want us to turn to John 13. Just going to look at a couple more passages this morning. Look in John 13. This is the night before Jesus' death. In he has just finished lowering himself to the position of a servant and washing the disciples' feet, even washing the feet of Judas, his enemy who was just about getting ready to leave and go betray him. And then he says this in John 13, 31 to 35. Therefore, verse 31, when he had gone out, that's when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. But a new commandment I give to you, 
that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus is saying that God's glory is truly revealed in his servant love. Not just the love that he had just shown his disciples in washing their feet, but the love he's about to show the very next day when he dies on a cross for the sins of the world. An act which will ultimately lead to more of God's glory in the resurrection and ultimately lead to Jesus going back home to be with his Father in heaven. Somewhere Jesus says to his disciples, you can't follow me right now. And the disciples' hearts are broken by this. But Jesus reassures them and says, they can't come right now, but they will follow later. He says, right now, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And now listen to this exchange in our final passage this morning in John 14, verse 4. John 14, 4, Jesus said, you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You know, I don't know if Jesus was alluding to the highway in Isaiah or not. <laughs> but with all of that background in mind, it's hard not to see some connection there. That essentially Jesus is saying, I am the highway back home to God. And if you want to know how to walk that highway of holiness back home, I'll show you with my truth. And I'll clear that pathway for you so that you can have full access to the highway home to God. Remember, Isaiah said, no one who is unclean can travel on that highway. And what Jesus did on the cross was remove our uncleanness from us so that now as the ransomed of the Lord, as the redeemed of the Lord, we can do what Isaiah said and we can return with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon our heads and sorrow and sighing can flee away. You know, because of Jesus, we already get a taste of that return home to heaven right now in the church, because we've come, as Hebrews 12 says, to, to Mount Zion, to the general assembly of the, of the saints, the church of the firstborn. But we can also look forward to the full experience of joy. When either Jesus returns or our life ends, and we take that final journey down the highway of holiness home to our Father in heaven forever. And so as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, let's pour out our hearts in gratitude for Jesus, our highway builder.